Yeah, did everybody have a chance to grab something off the table? There, I see a lot of things up here, but maybe if, if you didn't want to get anything, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to find out what you picked up. Do you guys want to grab anything? If you, you're welcome to, but if you, don't, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Just something that looks like of interest. Um, let's see here. Oh, we have a book over here. This book is really trippy. We're just going to kind of go through this real fast. What, what time do we need to, to wrap up tonight? Uh, Eight o'clock. Good, good. Okay. This book right here, and we'll take a break in just about like five minutes. Okay. We'll take a break. But this book here is crazy. Okay. It's a boy's guide to heavenly mother. Have you guys ever seen that? Heavenly father has a wife and he's probably got lots of them. Okay. That, because but they, they may not come out and say that in this book, but that's a whole other segment of Mormon history and all. But this almost kind of, to me, this, this, this is, oh, I can't even, I can't even talk hardly, but it's just really, a, a, it's, it's like, it's like a, what would you call it? Like, like a cultic pagan, uh, oh, like almost like Gnostics, new agey, new agey not, yeah, like um, Greek mythology kind of a vibe that it gives off and stuff. It, is, it has no biblical pattern, no biblical premise whatsoever. And yet a boy's guide to this, this is the idea about, about um, the divinity of, of us, that we are like little gods in embryo and we're going to become a god someday and that we have this, this goddess wife, a god, that, have, that have, God the Father has a goddess wife. I don't even like to call him God the Father because that's not who he is, you know. It's the Mormon heavenly father that they would, they would call him, okay. So anyway, yeah, that's just one very interesting thing there. And I think we have something over here about how we got the Bible, Bible translations. These are all important things. And, and we have, you know, we want to help the Mormon to see that we can trust the Bible. And why do we have all these translations? And, and, and a little brochure like that could help somebody with that. And that's a whole big topic. We could spend a whole hour and a half talking about that. But I, I love that topic. Um, over here, we've got um, Jason, who has... This is the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. And in Genesis 50, Joseph Smith pops his name in there to prophesy about himself. That someday he'll be coming on the scene. Isn't that crazy? And also, Jason, if you look up Romans 4, 5. And, so, yeah. So Romans 4, 5. Read that for us in a second. And then tell us when you, when you, when you found it. Romans 4, 5. And you'll just see there's one word that he adds well, yeah, read, read the, yeah, yeah, read, yeah, read, read, read the. And that seeketh not to be justified by the law of works, but believeth on him who justifieth not the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Not the ungodly. So he, he justifies the ungodly. That's what it says in Romans 4, 5. But Joseph says, not the ungodly. So you have to be godly to be justified I mean, you, you go cuckoo, okay? And that's sad, but that's, that's part of what people are coming out of Mormonism find is just this, this, just this, this just concoction of all these ideas. And it's like, it reminds me of this stuff back in the first, second century called the like, Gnosticism. Kooky stuff, you know, and it's still going on today. Okay, so what do we have over at this table here, Corey? Any, anything that you can see? That people picked up. Oh, that book right there. Mm. Right. So we have a, okay. All right. So, so right here we have an introduction. Oh, introducing. Yeah. Yeah. A Christian guy who's with a ministry called um, Mormonism Research Ministry. And, and um, that's an extra copy. So Corey, if you want to take a look at that, hang on to it. I think it's a good one. I think it's a good one. So um, that, that helps us you know, reach out to Mormons. And then what you found back there, that's an old, like 1914. It's like a, it's like a little pamphlet magazine thing for Mormons, for, for women, I think, right? Somebody just gave me a big box full of all these old Mormon publications and stuff. So that's what that is. And then anything else? Do you have something? Okay. A book by Ron Rhodes, Reasoning from the Scriptures. Okay. And what's that word there above the word Mormons? With the Mormons. Okay, reasoning from the scriptures with the Mormons. Okay, so a big old thick book. And so there's good resources out there like that. Okay, a lot of people, some good people have written a lot of good books. So, and then what do we have over, oh, right here, this is a little bank. 
This is to where when you're a kid and you, you, you go make some money, you put, you put 10% of it for tithing, you give that to the Mormon church, you put some of it into, a third of it into your future mission you're going to go on, and then the other half is an ice cream cone, and that says fun. So they're trying to give you discipline to someday, you know, go on a mission, make sure you start giving to, your, to the Mormon church, <coughs> and have a little fun while you're at it there. So thank you. All right. What do we have over here? We have the Church History Museum. So that's in Salt Lake City. That's a good sized museum. And that's um, quite interesting. You can talk to people that are the curators and the docents and stuff, and you can share with them. And they tell you all about Mormon background and history and everything. This is a, a fairly new book by a guy named um, Corey Miller and Ross Anderson responding to the uh, Mormon missionary message. I haven't had a chance to read that yet, but I have a feeling it's going to be pretty good. Uh, thank you so much. And then there's a copy of the, the Mormon scripture, the Book of Mormon. All those places, that n nowhere is it ever mentioned in the Book of Mormon about like the idea of three heavens or becoming a god or key distinctives about Mormonism. So in the introduction to the Book of Mormon, it says that a man will get nearer to God by abiding by the precepts in that book than any other book. But yet Mormonism is really not in the book. So that's something that you can kind of kindly bring up to somebody who's LDS and just as a, a talking point. Yeah. It's probably coming from doctrine and covenants or, or kind of like in Islam, the Hadith, it comes from teachings of the prophets. Yeah, but the Book of Mormon is supposed to be the keystone of their religion, but it really doesn't have that. So if you ask a Mormon, possibly like, well, where does it say in the Book of Mormon about getting baptized for the dead or being sealed in the temple the, the, or getting married in the temple? You know, it doesn't say anything like that. And it's all because of just the fact that I think Joseph Smith kind of evolved in his thinking about his religion that he, that he started back in the eight, early 1800s. And when the Book of Mormon was written, he didn't think at the time to put that, that kind of stuff in there. Or, or, he, or maybe he, I don't know his, his mind, but maybe he, he, he plagiarized a lot of things from the Bible in the Book of Mormon. So there's lots of parts of Isaiah that are in that. But his, his big teaching was about, about Heavenly Father, that he's, he's an exalted, glorified, resurrected man. And get, and get this, if that's the case, could he have sinned before? Quite possibly so. So how would you like to be worshiping an entity that's, that's, sin, that's sinful, basically? See, so things like that start coming to your mind and, and start resonating with you like, wow, what is this that I'm a part of? So, and what you have right there that you got opened up, that has Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. So there, that's an older copy, and that has scripture in there that they would call scripture, okay, that's, that's very sacred to the Mormons, and they would consider that as like the teaching. Like, if you want to look at something really, really creepy, it's section 132 in the Doctrine and Covenants, just about verse 60. You can read about that and see what that's all about. So back there, the dudes back there, we got, okay, that's the welfare plan. So the Mormon church has like a strong system of taking care of like food needs, you know, um, you know, paying, helping you pay your rent, uh, things like that. Yeah. Okay. To help people help themselves in the process. I think they're going to help them a lot though. I think, you know, that, that, that's the intent. Yeah. They do. They don't want them to be on it forever but they will help people in you. And so they, they do have that, that really keeps people in the Mormon church. If you lose your job, whatever's going on in your life, they, they have a, what they call a bishop storehouse. You might see that, that com, uh, compound word in there. And they just have a lot of resources. I mean, they demand 10% of your, of your gross income. And if you don't pay your full tithe, you get a letter in the mail. I'm not kidding you. They have a clerk for each congregation. And if they know that you're a dentist and you're pulling in this many G's and you come to the end of the year and you've only given this much and you should have given this much, then, then they'll say, Hey, brother, brother Johnson. I mean, what's, what's up, you know, and we need to like get this settled. Don't we? A, a tithing settlement is what they'll call it. So what do you got back there? Okay. So somebody gave that to me 
um, it was um, used when that person, that little girl there, was a Mormon. Um, she married a guy who's on our board for our ministry. You see all those little stickers and stuff? This would be the equivalent to like Mormon Awana, okay? Do you guys do Awana here? Okay, we did, okay, so, so it's, it's that kind of, a, it's just a system, you know, of, of uh, learning these verses and stuff, but this is the Articles of Faith, and then other little stickers, things you memorize or things you do, and you hang this up there, and, and basically, um, that's just something that she had, and she just wanted me to share it with people, and it was like a little part of her elementary life as a Mormon girl. So you've got, you've got the Articles of Faith in there, and, and you, can, you can see one of them is um, talking about be, uh, by obedience to, uh, like read, 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 read the, the first Article of Faith, what does the one on the far left say? Okay, and what's the second one? Not for Adam's transgression. See, so they define, they'll use words like that, like the first one, it might sound like it's Christian, but then you have to dig deep and find out who, what do they believe about these, about these, these descriptions of these people, these persons uh, about God and everything. But did you notice what, what was just read? They don't believe in Adam's transgression passing upon all men. So they don't believe that. Believe, they believe that we're only punished for our own personal sins. So there's a big, big problem there. So let's see, what else do we have? Anything else? Okay, that's a, that's a doozy right there. That's called the Nauvoo Expositor. There's a man named William Law, and he was the printer of this, of this newspaper. And he was not happy because the story goes is that Joseph Smith was, uh, let's just say, you know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't being true to his wife. And he, and he kind of, you know, made an advance on his wife. And so he was doing the polygamy thing. And, and taking other men's wives and things like this, it was crazy, you know. Well, that newspaper right there was printed and it, and it basically, it, it's not on that first page, I don't think, but you have to kind of dive into it. Does it, does it open up? Okay, it, it's, it's kind of embedded in there. On the left column, I'm thinking on that second page, I think. Well, when Joseph got wind of this, he was upset. And so his faithful boys went to that printing press and destroyed it. And he said, no more. You're not going to be, you know, talking about this anymore. That's enough. Well, when you did that in the state of... Illinois, in, um, in uh, Nauvoo, Illinois, well, that was considered a big deal. And so that was going against one of the, um, you know, like the Constitution, the freedom of the press. And so he was put into jail. And uh, when he was in jail, um, this is what happened here. Maybe you saw this when you came up to the table. But due to a lot of things going on, um, his brother was in jail with him and he got shot and then Joseph tried to escape and so a bunch of guys stormed the jail and started shooting their guns through the door and one killed his brother Hiram and then Joseph tried jumping out the window and he did like a Masonic call for help but nobody helped him and he jumped out of the window and then they shot him down at the, at the bottom of the, the window well there. Um, windowsill. Um, so that's what that's all about. So just some very sad, awful things that took place. That's, and that was the same year that Joseph Smith did what they call the King Follett Discourse. And it was at a funeral service for a guy. And he said, let me tell you how God came to be God. And he was a man just like we were. And he went on all this, all this false teaching. And he was also running for president about the same time. And uh, so this is 1844. And so then he died. And then Brigham Young took the, the, the Mormon people across the plains and settled Utah. And, and uh, he, he led there for about 50 years before it became a state an actual state. So for 50 years, they did polygamy pretty much just, you know, without any interference. But then the United States government said, we don't want you doing this anymore. And they, they said, you got to stop this or we're going to come in with our cannons and take over this, this territory. 
but then they said, okay, we'll stop it, which they didn't totally, but um, then they became a state. And so a lot of interesting history stuff. Anything at this table right here that anyone picked up that you want to share about? I think I saw something. Oh, yeah, just a, a little thing about maps. See, th- th- we, we as Christians, we might look at that and, and kind of take it for granted. You know, but we have Bible maps. Look at all those maps that we have. We have places. We have cities. We have, we have countries. We have so many things to verify our message. But you go to the Book of Mormon, and there's literally nothing. There's nothing, you guys. And I can, I mean, fact check me on that. F- try to find a city that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon and try to find a coin for it. Try to find a city. I mean, there's, there's nothing. I mean, they mentioned Jerusalem, but because they believe that a guy named Lehi came over to the Americas in like a submarine with his family. And they have a thing called the Liahona that is like a compass that, that like lights up like a light bright thing to tell you what to do, like a little, like a Ouija board or some type of like crystal ball or something like that. So there's just, there's just so many things um, that should deepen our compassion for these Mormon people, you know? And, and I, 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 I want to um, take a quick break. I told you we'd have a break. Let's take a, like, a, like about a five minute break and then we'll just come back and we'll spend a little more time talking about the Mormon view of Christ, okay? Let's take a five minute break. Um, this is kind of cool. Um, for this Bible museum that we're putting together at our ministry house, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I could get some pages of old Bibles with Isaiah 43.10? So the Lord led me to this, this small uh, small ministry in, in Washington state. And he got me a copy, uh, not, not, excuse me, not a copy, an actual page from the great Bible, from the Thomas Matthews Bible and from the Bishop's Bible, which were all, and the King James, like all written around 15, uh, not, not, not the Matthews one, but the great Bible, the Geneva Bible. Anyway, these Bibles that are like right before King James, and it just shows that God has preserved his word going way back. And so um, Isaiah 43.10 is a great verse to share. 43, 44, 45, there are some amazing verses um, to, to read with your Mormon friends. But 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. So, verses like that, or, or, or John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, or, or Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord... Um, let me read that so I don't mess it up. Deuteronomy 6, 4. This is a great verse because it, it combines the word Jehovah and, and Adonai in the same in the same verse, Mormons only equate the word Jehovah with Jesus. So they, they, they mix things up. But this verse here, Deuteronomy 6, 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, Elohim, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, all your might. So, I think I got that right on the different ter- uses of the word Lord. And, and I'll, I'll double check that to make sure I did that right. But you have capital L-O-R-D. Um, and you have the word God. And, and so it's a very unique verse. Because it, it talks about the singularity of God within the idea of a trinity also. So it's a bit mysterious and hard for us to understand. But John 1.1 1, 1, Isaiah 43.10, Deuteronomy 6.4. Those are some verses that you can ask a Mormon. You can say, hey, what, what, what do you believe on, on the nature of, of God based on these verses? And see, oftentimes Mormons will, will say, well, we use the Book of Mormon and the Mormon prophet as our, as our uh, way of determining what's in the Bible. See, so now you have to peel the onion back again and say, okay, well then, but then isn't Jesus enough? You know, isn't, does it, in, in Hebrews when it says that God spoke in the past through prophets, but now he, now he does through, through his son. Um, there's a lot of things you have to go through and, and find out from a, from a Mormon person, where, what is your authority? 
and things of that nature. Now, when it comes to Jesus, Mormons believe that Jesus is the brother of Lucifer. And so, and so when you're talking about Jesus, you have to remember they have a different Jesus. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, he basically said in about verses four through seven, I believe it is, he says, I'm nervous. He says, I'm concerned about you guys. I'm, I'm concerned that you're following after a different Jesus, a different gospel and a different spirit. It's a really great verse that we should be familiar with because, because we have to be ready for that. Whether it's Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses, you know, we have to have a compassion for these people for sure. You know, it, it says in 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26, it says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. So what does that mean? That means you don't let your veins pop out of your neck and get in their face two inches away and start screaming at people. You know, you don't do that. You don't have to do that. But you can be a kind, gentle, patient teacher. And, and, and so we have to understand that this Mormon view of Jesus is so corrupt. It's so, so bizarre that, that even, even how he gained his, his, his physical body on earth, I don't even want to go into the details with it because of the ages of the kids in the room right now. But it's, 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 it's totally a, um, a twistianity. It twists it all. And I just think we need to recognize that you, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So, so we, we have to, we have to under, make sure that what we're preaching is the right Jesus. It's the Jesus of the Bible. It's not just some, you know, convoluted idea of Jesus. You know, the Mormon Jesus in between his crucifixion and resurrection supposedly went to the Americas. Okay. The Mormon Jesus, they believe would say that they would say that he is going to set up his kingdom in independence, Missouri and Jerusalem. So, so I could go on and on and on about all these things. Um, but, but these are, these are just some of the things to kind of scratch the surface and, and what my wife and I want to do is we want to just be available for, for you, you guys, you know, anytime. I mean, Corey has our phone number. If you ever want to talk to my wife or myself, we will together talk with you over the phone. We'll be your, your coach. You know, you got the missionaries coming over. We'll, we'll work in tandem with Pastor Phil and Pastor Corey. I mean, we want the local church to be the, you know, we want to come, we want to come truly alongside the church. We want to do this paracaleo idea. We want to try to do it right. You know, we want to, we don't want to replace anything that the local church, the local church has, has people that have giftings that are unique, you know, and we, and, and, it, and you have a place in the body of Christ, you know, and, and, and you have a place and, and there's, um, there's people that care about you and want to help you like this, this neighbor that was mentioned, you know, I mean, we gotta, we gotta be praying, you know, we gotta be praying and, and trying to figure out how do we reach this 65 year old lady? You know, if the Lord might open the door for that and, um, something to pray about, you, you don't want to just go off in your flesh and try to pull that off, you know, cause it can, it can feel like then you're just doing it out of your own strength, you know, but you want to do it in a, in a way that is honoring to the Lord and there's, there's ways to do it. Absolutely. So that's exciting to see what's going to happen. And then uh, man, I, I, get, I look forward to hearing about Reagan's story, you know, where, where Reagan's at, you know. Um, you heard from that guy, Nick, you know, his parents are both active in it, you know, so he, he's living under their roof right now. So you can be praying for him and um, just be praying for us, you know, in Utah with this Bible museum. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about, well, what, what kind of spiritual warfare are we going to experience? Is, 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 are we going to have... I don't know what could happen. I don't want to think about it too much. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. But we'll trust God though, right? We'll trust, we'll trust him. We'll trust, we'll trust the Lord, God doing amazing things at Gold Country. And, and um, so, so we, we kind of touched on a few things tonight that I hope will help. Um, let me just see if there's anything um, that I wanted to mention. Oh, one thing I have to mention to you really quick is just that, boy, when you see these Mormon missionaries, um, like we're going to see tomorrow, just possibly, you know, understand that Mormons don't believe that Jesus is God. And so we believe that, that Jesus is God the Son, that, that the Father, we call him God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So one God, 
okay? Three persons. Um, but Mormons um, don't look at it that way. Um, in fact, the blood of Christ doesn't even cleanse from every sin. There are some sins that you have to shed your own blood to pay for. Um, also, the idea of worshiping Jesus is a foreign concept to a Mormon person. Because you know why? Because they say you're only supposed to worship God. And Jesus is not God. And therefore, you don't pray to him. You don't worship him. So isn't that sad? I, I talked to some Mormon missionaries one time and I just said, can you just say thank you, Jesus? And they wouldn't say a word. They just stared at me. It was the weirdest thing, you know? And I, I realized I'm, I'm kind of like, I wasn't being rude, I don't think. I was just trying to help them see what, what, how they've taken the Lord's Prayer and taken it to a weird, twisted extreme. Because although it says, our Father, which art in heaven, okay, primarily, yeah, do we pray to the Father? But we can pray to the, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, there's no sin in, in directing your prayers to Jesus. I don't think that's wrong. I, I, I just, you know, so I just think um, it's something that, um, boy, when you, when you pray with a Mormon person, if you just, you know, you, if you just say, not, not when I say with, I want to be careful with that, not with as we're both brothers in Christ or something, but if you say, can I say a prayer? And, we, and your prayer can be powerful. Your prayer can be one filled with, with verses in it, and it can be, you know, it can be moved by the Lord to just, be a, uh, an evangelistic prayer, you know, for that person. Maybe they've never heard how to become a Christian and you can spell it out to them and you can say, I want to talk with you more about this. You know, I care about you. And there's one little phrase, we'll kind of close with this. But if you can remember, there's, there's only this one little formulary kind of a little pattern of words that I think actually means something to Mormons. And I would write this down. And it, it, it's, it's taken from the Book of Mormon, actually. It's called a spirit of contention. And a spirit of contention is what you have when you're controlled by, this, by the devil. And it basically means that you're being controlled by him and you have like a hateful spirit towards somebody else. But if you use the card first, if you play that and you say, I want you to know, I don't have a spirit of contention. I know it sounds strange. I know it sounds awkward. And it's not what you would ever really say to any other people group, any culture, any type of a religious person, really. That doesn't make any sense. I don't have a spirit of contention. That's just weird. But for a Mormon, though, I can guarantee you that that person, if they've been Mormon for very long, they're going to go, oh, no, I, I, I know you don't have a spirit of contention. They're gonna, you're going to be talking Mormonese with them a little bit. You're going to be talking lingo that is, is along their understanding. And so, so that hopefully will be an encouragement to you. So, so tomorrow, if you're able to join, we're going to talk about the Mormon view of salvation. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, how to share the gospel with Mormons. It, it kind of it lends itself to what we were doing when we first got together. But I'll just tell you really quick, if you can't make it tomorrow, what you can simply do is just say to a Mormon person, Hey, would you mind just you know, sharing with me your story, how you became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how you became a Mormon? And they don't like to use the word Mormon much anymore, but let them correct you if, if, if they feel like that's necessary. Um, and then without, without validating it, but yet simply being respectful and just, just listening and, and not interrupting them, but just letting them tell you their story, Thank them for doing that, for being open enough to, to share with you their, the, the, a little bit about themselves. And now that you've done that, now you've earned the right to then ask the question, well, hey, thanks for sharing that with me. Do you, mind if, do you mind if I share my testimony with you real quick? So now it's not like a pushed kind of a thing. You're not being pushy at all. You've, you've genuinely listened to this person share their story. But now you've asked permission, can I share my story with you and share what your life was like what it was like before Christ, what happened at salvation, and what your life has been like since. And if you felt, raise your hand if you felt pretty comfortable sharing your testimony with the person next to you. Felt pretty comfortable, okay, you know? It might be a little scary, a little bit like, oh, well, you know, I hope I'm saying the right, all the right words and stuff. And okay, you know, God will help you with the, with the details. Those details are important. Yeah, you want to understand. That's why, did you notice when I was talking to Nick, I tried to, because as I'm listening to Nick, I'm like, Okay, but have you put your faith and trust in Christ alone? And I, and I, I tried to like make it real spoon-fed for him because you know he could be confused. He could be a little bit, he could be like right on the edge. 
and not having really done that. But I think he has. It's just from what I'm hearing, unless, unless I'm missing something. So, so that's cool. So um, why don't we just, um, any, any quick questions? We have like just like, a, you know, just a couple minutes. I'll be here if you want to talk afterwards. But any thoughts, qu- questions or anything? Yeah, this pre-existence. Okay, so when I was a kid, being in the Mormon church, I really believe that I was up there in heaven with everybody who's ever come to earth. Except people, well, it, it, with, a, with a lot of people. Let's just keep it simple right now. I, I believe that there was a, this war in heaven because, because Lucifer wanted to make it possible for everyone to become a god someday. Jesus said, no, we want to give everyone the freedom to choose that for themselves. But there's this idea of, I, I did have some inkling of a heavenly mother, I think, just a little bit. But we were taught that we were with Heavenly Father, we were with Jesus, we were with Lucifer, but we had to prove ourselves. So even though things were pretty cool up there as a spirit person, you're like a spirit, born as a spirit baby, and then you kind of had a spirit existence, I guess. But then if you wanted to become, and I don't even know if I understood this very much, but, but the way they would teach it, though, is that unless you wanted to, if you wanted to become a god, you had to have a physical body. So the idea was you get sent down to earth. Your spirit up in heaven gets sent down to earth. And now you're in this home and now you have to show yourself. You have to prove yourself that you're worthy to return to Heavenly Father. But then there's the three degrees of glory and that's where you become a god yourself. And so who needs God because you can become a god yourself and on we go. And now you're going to be worshipped someday. So, so this is all entrenched, you know, so when you're talking to a Mormon person, um, I, I, I have this little brochure up here. If you'd like one of these, it says, is Mormonism Christian? And it's got about 10 different things. If you're, if you're still kind of wondering tonight, is Mormonism Christian? Just take one of these and this will help um, a lot to in, reinforce the importance of sharing your story, sharing the gospel, the true gospel uh, with our Mormon friends. So that's a little bit about the pre-existence. Yeah, yeah. It is, and it's not in the Book of Mormon, but it's a foundational teaching though. You could ask them that too. You could say, where is that taught in the Book of Mormon? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that, if, if the introduction says that a man will get nearer to God by abiding the precepts of this book than any other book, wouldn't that be taught by Nephi or the good guys in the Book of Mormon, all these heroes and these, these, these prophets of God? And so even, okay, even when Jesus, they say, and there's a book called Third Nephi, towards the end of the Book of Mormon, where they say that G, just as when Jesus came to the Americas and he's there teaching, wouldn't you think if at least in that little book Jesus would have taught about that, that he would have taught about something about these, these specific key Mormon concepts and stuff? Like getting married in the temple or doing baptisms for the dead because, you know, teenagers do that all the time. You come out to Utah and you'll go to the temple and you'll see parents taking their kids and their hair's all wet because they've been being baptized for dead people, you know? So it's really sad how, how this, this is a, it's an intertwined system. I mean, they've got Brigham Young University. They've got, they've got the mission thing. They, they, you come home from your mission and you're like a, a soldier coming back from war. You know, you're a man or a woman of valor, you know, and you've got a job probably waiting for you. You've got a girlfriend or boyfriend waiting for you or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's just a very tightly woven system. But God can break through it, right? Like Nick, like myself and others. Yeah. So um, I'm going to just turn it back over to Corey and any closing thoughts and have him pray us out tonight. So thanks so much. Russ, thank yeah. you, brother. Yeah. Just, yeah, thank you. If you haven't had a, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at, at this notes sheet there, there's some there's some really interesting gems in there. And, and Russ, I understand you didn't go into this, but I'll just I'll just read this sentence to you that, that Russ wrote. Uh, Jesus gained a human body by way of the heavenly Father having relations with Mary, not being overshadowed by the Spirit. Russ, you didn't go into depth. I feel a little more free pastorally to do that. I think the reason I want to just point that out to you is because. W- what makes Mormonism different than any other pagan religion where gods come down and they, and they, uh, they procreate with human beings in, in an immoral and, and wicked way? 
nothing. It's exactly the same, right? It is pagan and wicked and evil and immoral and disgusting. But I think, you know, Russ will help us kind of think through this tomorrow as we think about questions to ask. Um, those are things that they don't want to talk about, right? Because it's really easy for us to be like, oh, I've, I've heard of stuff like that. Like in Greek mythology and, and you know, the, the Norse gods and all, all of that kind of pagan religion, that's exactly what this is. And so it's just, it's just wicked and, and disgusting. And, and, and there's also kind of that ick factor to us, for us sometimes. We kind of read something like that. You go, oh, man, Mormons, they're, they, how could they believe stuff like that? It's so wicked and so gross and so immoral. I, I think just encourage us to resist kind of the ick factor of like, uh, icky Mormons, I can't, I can't talk with them, hang out with them. They believe terrible things. Just like Russ said, just remember they are, they are trapped, they're lost in their sin. And, and unless someone faithful like that lady, you know, shares the gospel with them and loves them, uh, despite this just uh, wild theology, uh, that they won't come to know Christ. God uses instruments like us to, to share Christ with them. So, so just be prayerful that God would help us. Sometimes even we read things like that and it's, it's even easy to, to laugh maybe, like to think it's, oh, it's silly or it's just ridiculous, but it's not to them. This is their life. So, so Russ, thank you so much, brother. Well, let, let me pray. I will do that. And um, Russ, you know, he's, he's uh, what time is it in Utah right now? It's nine o'clock. It's bedtime. So, but Russ is like the energizer bunny. So if you got questions, uh, I know he'd love to answer and help you think through how to interact with people. And we'll do that more and more. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time again. Uh, we're just so grateful that, that you, uh, you have revealed the gospel. There, there's one way and one truth and one life, and that is Christ. Jesus, you are the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through you. You, through your perfect life, your uh, full righteousness, your, all, your obedience to the Father, all of that, uh, where we were n are not righteous, we are, we are not holy, we are not obedient. Christ, you did all of that on, on our behalf, and then you, you died a sacrificial death on our, in our place and rose again or seated at the right hand of the Father and are coming again. All of that you have revealed. It's, it's clear, uh, but it's not to those whose, whose eyes have not been opened, who's, uh, who are still living in the dark. And, and that's true of our LDS friends. They are in the dark just as we once were until you opened our eyes. So help us to remember them that way. Help us to, to remember that, that such were some of us you know, living for ourselves, uh, living in, in unrighteousness and self-righteousness and, and lost, lost in this world. So help us to have compassion and, and sympathy and, and uh, a desire to see them come to know you. And, and I do pray for uh, Lisa's neighbor. We pray that you would give the Trepepis uh, just great opportunities to minister to this family. Uh, to wrap their arms around them, to show them the love of Christ and that they would be saved, oh Lord, that you would, you would draw them and, and do a mighty work in their lives for your glory. Well, thank you for this time tonight and all that we'll learn tomorrow and we look forward to the, the, um, the things you have to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen.